Um, now it's time for the next speech. Uh, today we have, we are honored to have Gabor Holtz with us. For those who uh, don't know Gabor, he's going to introduce himself, but um, he's going to talk about a very interesting topic for us, which is the China's World Garden, opening, closing, and the resulting opportunities for businesses. With its billion plus consumer market and a protective state that watches over it, its global trade, mega acquisitions and ruthless restrictions, China has become the iconic risk in the world of an entrepreneur's dream, perhaps the final frontier of our planet. Based on two decades of China-based international experience, inter intercultural leadership consultant Gabor Holt invites the audience of, you know, of uh, this keynote speech to ponder three basic yet far-reaching questions. One, how has China opened this market to the world since the new millennium and why? Two, how has China kept itself isolated from the wider world in the meantime and why? And finally, how can European business leaders and firms harness the opportunities presented by China's World Garden if they decide to do so? Gabor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Laura. And I, I hope we haven't scared anybody with this serious introduction. So uh, I promise that I will try not to be dry I would like to first very briefly introduce myself, and then I would like to start sharing my slides. So I am Gabor Holsch. I'm talking to you from Shanghai, China. I have been uh, an international um, intercultural leadership consultant for about uh, uh, almost 15 years now here since I opened my company. I arrived in China in 2002, and I have been based here ever since, although with extensive international travel under the COVID situation, until the COVID situation put an end to that. So now I mostly do my work uh, virtually like everybody else out of my uh, Shanghai home office that you can see here. So indeed, today I would like to bring you two different perspectives. One of them is myself as an SME owner and SME manager, because I uh, my team is quite small, although our clients are quite big. And the other one is the experience that I learned from my clients who are mostly larger multinational companies. But I would like to remind everybody that a lot of billion dollar businesses, they actually start up in China as SMEs, even if they are quite big in the world. They get a couple of people in and then they are building up from uh, what you would definitely call an SME situation with just a couple of people in a shared office. I wonder if you can see my slides now. Good. All right. Thank you very much. So indeed, I would like to bring this world garden uh, idea. I mean, if you, for example, if you study social studies or psychology, that you know what the concept of a world garden means, creating uh, a system that is that approaches perfection with insight and trying to keep the negative influences of the rest of the world outside. So I will try to approximate um, talking to you for about 25 minutes so that we have um, plenty of time for questions afterwards. Please be aware that while, I'm, while I am speaking to you, I cannot see the chat box. So if there is anything important coming in, then I will, I will rely on you, Laura, to uh, interpret it for me. So let me start. Uh, by simply introducing myself uh, just very quickly. I am Hungarian. I am uh, a, um, a management consultant, as I told you. Now, in the meantime, I wonder if I managed to... Yes, my camera is still working. I, I stopped seeing myself. So um, I was a junior diplomat for a couple of years uh, in international development, which is going to be relevant to some of the points I would like to make later on. And then I got a little bit bored um, of working for large uh, development organizations like the United Nations. I wanted to create my own thing, came to China in 2002. And in 2005, I started up company management consulting, which is now specialized in intercultural leadership, coaching, advisory training. And also I make keynotes and I write about the same issues. So please, uh, I would, I would recommend that, although at the, at the end, we will still have a contact slide, but take a picture or a screenshot of this slide if you, if you think you would like to email me later on. Because uh, for the question and answer, 
I will try not to use a slide. So what do I mean by China opening and China closing? When I speak about this topic, people often ask me, so ultimately is China opening or is China closing? And of course the answer is both in a way. And to, to explain how that works and why that's important, I would like to go back in time a little bit to the beginning of what uh, Chinese people like to call the uh, era of reform and opening, Geiger Kaifeng, which was a time when uh, China had been a planned economy based on Marxist-Leninist principles for quite a few decades. And although it had lots of benefits in terms of education, for example, in terms of um, um, building modernity in China, but in terms of economic development, it was a little bit of a disaster. So at that time, especially when you looked at international investment, China was in desperate need of new resources. So um, perhaps some of you are old enough to remember or have studied in school that in 1972, the American president Nixon visited China. Um, this was one of the um, original ideas behind the reform and opening. And there was a big dilemma here because for decades, China as a political system has been basically hostile to capitalist investment. So the question was how to invite American firms, Japanese firms, European firms, Australian, South Korean, and so on companies to invest in the economy in China without changing the fundamental characteristics of a, um, um, a political system that was basically imported from the Soviet Union and many of its fundamental elements are still there today. So for example, you know that China has a five-year plan. China is run by a communist party. China is running a mostly planned economy. State-owned enterprises are very important and so on. And the idea that finally allowed this partial opening was the so-called special economic zones. Special economic zones are basically islands of market economy within a non-market economy. When China started experimenting with special economic zones um, in the south of China in the 1980s, they relied on existing and, and uh, quite positive experiments in some other countries, such as India, uh, quite a few Middle Eastern countries and so on. And each of these countries had the same concept, tried to isolate islands or oases of um, international investment so that they don't have to make fundamental changes with the social, the political, or the legal system that was uh, the fundamental uh, idea behind that society. So uh, in, uh, for example, in the Middle East, uh, that was a religious concept, um, the legal system built on Islam. In China, it was the system that we know today. And that resulted in quite a couple of interesting things. I am going to focus on one, which is not the economic part, but more the cultural part. So actually you will find that a lot of the things that I'm going to tell you in this short keynote have actually been said by previous speakers before. I would like to summarize them and put them into a so-called wider concept. So if you look at China today, the special economic zones are proliferating, but they are still different from the mainstream economy. Uh, how are they uh, different? For example, when a Chinese citizen moves over to, to most of your countries and open a company there, you, uh, the, the Chinese citizen is going to open a local company. So in Hungary, they are going to open a Hungarian company. In the Philippines, a, a local company uh, like any other Filipino citizen in the United States, an American company. A foreigner, as you know, including SMEs, when you come over to China and you open a company, you open a foreign owned enterprise, which is a different kind of legal entity in terms of licenses, in terms of regulations and so on. There are a shortening, but still quite long so-called negative list, which includes industries and sectors where internationally invested companies are not allowed to participate. So basically uh, starting from the more obvious, but going down to the, to the less obvious, 
international investors in China are not allowed to start an energy company, a defense contractor, for example, but also a telecom company, companies in different financial sectors, and lots of others that if you want, and if you haven't heard about this from previous speakers, I'm very happy to give you a little bit of details. And then finally, you probably know about the prominence of state-owned enterprises in many different sectors. And very often those sectors are overlapping with the sectors described by the negative list. And one of the important uh, consequences of this is that a lot of companies are excluded from certain competition in the Chinese market. For example, public procurement in terms of infrastructure development, in terms of telecom, in terms of certain financial services and so on. So China has uh, opened up to some extent, but it hasn't opened entirely. Now, this has resulted uh, in something which I think is absolutely crucial, but fairly overlooked for international entrepreneurs in China. If you um, um, open a book on intercultural business, and specifically, if you open a book that contains the so-called culture maps, the kind of culture map that I'm showing you right now, which places mainstream cultures of certain societies, in this case, countries, into a map of human behaviors. So in this case, what you can see is the disk map, which gives you two dimensions. On top, we have proactive or uh, extroverted behavior. And at the bottom, we have responsive or introverted behavior. On the left side, we have competitive, focused, task-driven uh, behavior. And on the right side, you can see cooperative, people-focused, more flexible behavior, which ends up with these four behavioral styles. Red is uh, high energy, competitive, tough. Yellow is fun, flexible, imaginative, curious. Green is caring, service-minded, listening, mentoring culture. And finally, you have the perfectionist, uh, low-risk, process-driven blue culture. So when you look at a book that includes these kind of comparisons, then usually we place China somewhere in the green corner based on the assumption that traditionally China is a Confucian society, or at least based on Confucian traditions, which means um, takes harmony very seriously, reduces conflict, uh, obedient, hierarchical, and so on, which is true as a statistical average, but is blatantly not true about certain very important places in modern China. So if you come to China and let's say you work in agriculture, you work in academia, you work in a university, or you work mainly in the countryside, then you can see that Chinese people are really conflict averse, polite, obedient to authority and so on. But if you work in a place like Beijing, like Shenzhen, like Shanghai, where I'm talking to you from now, which most foreigners will when they come to China, then you will find that people are not following these Confucian standards of obediently uh, listening to authority, uh, collaborating and uh, avoiding conflict. Actually, you will find that people in these communities, they are fairly result driven, they are fairly competitive, they compete from a very young age, for example, the Gaokao examination, they compete for jobs, they compete for promotions. If they are an entrepreneur, they can be quite tough entrepreneurs, as a matter of fact. So what you will see here is these different cultures in China. And um, when we say opening in China, it's not just opening to the rest of the world, it's also opening to China's own past social traditions, which were considered the enemy uh, during the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. So you probably know Mao Zedong and the Communist Party in, in those days, they were actively repressing the um, traditional Confucian values of Chinese society. And with the Geiger Kaifang, with, with the reform and opening, there was a rediscovery of not only China's relationship with the outside world, but also Chinese people's relationship with these traditions, traditional Chinese traditions, which is extremely important because anybody who wants to do business here and wants to be successful has to be able 
to navigate between these different cultural values. So be tough when it's required, be soft when it's required, respect authority when it's required, for example, when you are dealing with local government, but be very polite and uh, very flexible when that's required. For example, when you are working with your own team, uh, many of whom come from a traditional uh, rural background. Okay, so um, let's see what this means in practical terms and also let's see what this means over time. I think that is a very interesting story. So I arrived in China in 2002, which was actually the high point of the reform and opening process. China was gearing up to the 2008 Olympics. Um, I remember when I first arrived in, in, uh, in Shanghai, every was, everything was being rebuilt everything was being repainted and everybody was very expectant of these big changes to come. Also, everybody knew that two years after the Olympics uh, in Shanghai, we would host the International Expo. Taxi drivers were all learning English. Um, Hu Jintao, who was the leader of China at that time, made this uh, very famous statement that any company registered in the People's Republic of China has to become a local Chinese company. So if you, some of you, if you were at China, in China at that time, either as a visitor or as a resident, then you remember that the, um, the attitude to interaction with the, with the outside world, it was uh, quite different from today. In analyzing the 20th anniversary of China joining the World Trade Organization, the WTO, in a recent interview, Pascal Lamy, who was heading the WTO at the time of China's joining, he said that we can look back on 10 years of convergence and 10 years of divergence. Now, I cannot go into all of the reasons why this is a fact, but I do think that this is a fact. As far as the Chinese government is concerned, and as far as the Chinese population is concerned, in addition to all the blessings of opening up to the rest of the world, the biggest of which is China's tremendous economic growth, there have also been adverse influences of this opening up, such as uh, economic inequality, um, certain values uh, coming into China which are not quite uh, welcomed by the ruling Communist Party and, um, and, and others such as uh, one of our speakers was talking about the tech world in China and uh, the, the conflicts between uh, a, a tiny minority getting rich from the technology sectors and most of the people being left out, uh, monopolies and so on. So perhaps this is the biggest reason for um, this 10 years of convergence and 10 years of divergence but even if we don't know the reasons, we can list a couple of very important symptoms, what actually happened and, and uh, which is not up to interpretation. And of course, the most important and, and most well-known of that is China's restrictions of the internet, which started in 2007 and eight, and little by little, um, international applications created by Google, Facebook, Twitter, but also lots of new sites, um, internet services that people use for academic research, for uh, controlling robots, for hiring people, and lots of others are inaccessible in China uh, currently. Also, it became much more difficult to publish anything as an international company, not just books and, and newspapers, because um, publishing as an industry is actually on that negative list, but also, let's say, if somebody publishes a conference brochure in China now, it's better to involve a legal team to see if uh, there, is, there is nothing that can get the company in troubles. Also, you probably read in the news about China's trade wars initially with the United States, but then also South Korea, Japan, Australia, Canada, and other countries. And uh, recent restrictions, for example, in foreign investment in the education sector, in the tech sector, and more. One other um, consequence of this partial closing has been the partial withdrawal of certain international companies. So both the EU chamber 
and the American Chamber found out that year on year, about 10% of their member firms are withdrawing some investment from China, moving away some uh, operations and so on. And if you look at the number of foreign residents in China, then this is measurably dropping. And this is why I'm showing you this slide. Now, the interesting thing is, and, and this is something um, I hope it's, it, you can see it clearly, but if you cannot, feel, please feel free to contact me and I can send you these uh, graphs. This is the so-called McKinsey Exposure Index. The Exposure Index, it includes lots of things, including how much international content people see on the internet, how much international media, music, videos, eBooks, uh, physical books they consume, how much people travel abroad, how much uh, incoming tourism and business travel is into a country, investment and more. What you see here, I think is quite remarkable, that while around the time that I mentioned to you just now, so roughly around the time when internet restrictions in China came into effect, China's exposure to the world started dropping after a period of increase. So we could, we could go back a little bit into the past and you would see that actually China's exposure is much higher than it was in the 1980s, say, but is lower than at the beginning of the new millennium. In the meantime, the world exposure to China continues to increase. And, and this is understandable because if you look at the numbers behind it, while China started restricting not so much people, although visa requirements are getting tougher as well, but mainly information from the outside world, if you look at trade figures, they keep growing. If you look at investment figures, they keep growing. Even if you looked at pre-COVID tourism, uh, even if it was not growing dynamically, but it was not shrinking too quickly either. So there is this divergence between China's exposure to the world and the world's exposure to China. And I would like to demonstrate to you that this is a huge opportunity for international entrepreneurs, including SME leaders. In exposure, there is no going back. China is the biggest trading nation in the world. It is a key player in lots of industries like the pharmaceutical industry, the automotive industry, the telecom industry itself as well. There is no going back in these things. Maybe the exchange is going to happen in a different way in the near future, but the exchange is going to happen. So I think it is a reality that we have to accept from China that it is building a walled garden, which actually is a traditional concept. So if you have been in a city like Suzhou, you know what the concept of a walled garden is. A, um, a little paradise created within very specific barriers. Now, what you need to know about barriers, including uh, the Great Firewall, but also differences in legal system, differences in a financial system, differences in engineering standards, differences in lots of other things, is that business is like water. It flows and it creates energy. And when you create a barrier, and when there is a level difference between one side and the other side of the barrier, that will create even more dynamism, a little bit like building a dike in order to create a waterfall. Or if the water cannot go through in the form of a waterfall, then it will go through somewhere through creeks in the wall, all around it, or underneath it, or wherever it will find a way. And I would like to um, share with you how that works in business. Having a walled garden inside and very strictly controlled barriers through which the economic activity with the outside world can go, it's a very, very old concept in China. So some people say uh, the Great Wall is the only man-made object that can be seen from space. I don't know if that is true. I haven't been to space, but I think it's worth noting that China's biggest engineering project was actually part of the walled garden concept. And um, uh, people since Marco Polo had to enter China through this barrier and had to accept 
certain realities of how the economy worked. And one of them was something very, very similar to special economic zones today. So in Marco Polo's time or in the time of um, uh, missionaries, let's say three, 400 years ago in China, they were not allowed to um, be active wherever they wanted. They, they had these kind of hubs, uh, very much like the large cities of China today that we experience as foreigners. Now, we also um, have to be careful not to always blame these demarcations, these barriers for everything that happens that we deem, uh, let's say, not beneficial to international business. So for example, if you look at the reasons why foreigners are leaving China in significant numbers, that is mainly not for these barriers. Most of the foreign expertise leaves China because of reasons like robotics, for example. A large, about half of the companies in China, international companies in China traditionally have been manufacturing companies. A lot of manufacturing, uh, manufacturing jobs have been robotized and robots do not need mid managers. And mid managers was the light, largest number of foreigners in China. Also, technology re replaces um, foreign companies and foreign workforce in, in, in many other ways. In, uh, for example, in legal services, there are lots of uh, legal procedures done by artificial intelligence processes uh, right now. Consequently, actually most of the firms, that 10% that I mentioned to you from the research, they are divesting from China, not because they are being squeezed by regulation, but because their industry is simply either not needed in China, such as light industry, or it is the kind of polluting industry whose costs are uh, progressing upwards and it's simply not profitable to stay in China anymore. So in the future, because of COVID and also because of the regulations that we have been talking about, it has, been, uh, it has become more difficult even before COVID to get, let's say, a student visa or a short-term business visa. Um, even without COVID, it would be a little bit more difficult to just come here and start up a company, which is not specifically deemed necessary by the Chinese government. But there are lots of other ways to do business with China either inside or outside China. So please remember that we are living in an age right now where people find it difficult to move, but data find it's much, uh, finds it much easier to move. So if you look at it, how many ways can you think of that you can use to do business in China even without being inside of China? In order to invest in China, for example, invest in startups, you don't necessarily have to be here. Um, Im imagine things like 3D printing or additive manufacturing, where if you want to create a physical product in China, all you have to do is move a couple of machines, pieces of equipment, and <clears throat> move data in and out of the country, which is, which is not so difficult. Of course, some people, especially uh, in multinational companies, but to some extent, uh, the kind of SMEs that can afford this kind of mobility, they were insist in sending a couple of key people to China. And if you remember that McKenzie graph, it means there are going to be less and less of these foreigners in China, but there is going to be more and more business. So please remember if you speak the language, if you're willing to relocate here, the relative value of a well-trained foreigner in China is going to go up significantly because there are simply less foreigners in China and there is more to do here. Some international companies can enjoy significant competitive advantage. I'm sure that other speakers have been talking about, let's say, chip technology, or medical technology, marketing know-how, and so on. But if you have questions about this, I'm happy to come back to it uh, afterwards. Finally, and some of you may look at this presentation, have a deep sigh and say, you know, I would really love to be um, uh, in one of those companies that the previous speaker mentioned, learn those new technologies. I would like to try myself in the, in the newly created uh, Chengdu startup hub. But please remember that even if you're not in China, you can still do business with overseas Chinese people. I think they are, they are one of the most brilliant sons and daughters of this nation. 
they, some of them have lived abroad for a lifetime, for decades, sometimes generations. They have good connections here. They visited China regularly before COVID. They speak at least one dialect. And they know how this, to us, sometimes secretive uh, business networking of China works. So even if you don't do business in China, through them, you can do plenty of business with China. I would like to uh, leave you with, with three very important things to do. I, I wouldn't call them strategies, but I can, I can call them tactics if you want. In order to formulate your China strategy, whether you want to do business in China or with China. Why would I like to do it <clears throat> is um, actually I work with uh, multinational companies most of the time where it's extremely difficult to choose who they are sending to China. But with an SME, especially if it's a new startup with let's say just a few dozen people, it is even more important because the relative value of every single employee or manager is much bigger. So who comes to China? And I have seen quite a few SMEs that sent their smartest people to China and then they were facing the trouble who is running the business at home. So I would like to give you three pieces of advice, but I would like to give them in a reverse order. So I will show you number three first, number two uh, in the middle, and finally the first one, simply because the strategy implementation logic is to start from the top, start from the big picture, and then trickle down to the individual employee. But I think it's much easier to actually build up a strategy from the individual person up because uh, the entire company and the strategy is an abstraction. It's very difficult to, do, to make changes there. But to influence, to teach, to help, to empower individual employees, it is much more concrete and it's something that doesn't need that, uh, that much imagination and training. So let's look at um, three things and all of it rests on the data points that I shared with you in my speech so far. So the first thing that I would like you to know is that there is such a thing as a personal China fit. I showed you um, our, our previous culture maps. So you can map China in a culture map, starting from the big picture, any mainstream national culture. You can culture individual cities or types of cities. You can map corporate cultures. You can map any kind of societies and you can map individuals. So the brilliance of the system that you can see here is that you can compare individual behavior profiles with national or other types of culture. And um, after what I told you about Confucian culture and its relevance in modern China, you will not be surprised to hear that being a good Confucian is not the key performance indicator in China. However, we must know that China has these two cultures, the traditional, the patient, uh, the harmonious, and the tough, focused, competitive. So what I find very important is that the people who run your China business have a, a rough balance between the left and the right side, of um, which represents the left side is the task focus and the right side is the people focus or task style and people style. It doesn't have to be 50-50, as you can see, um, for example, the graph on the left side is, is about 70% uh, task focus and about uh, one third people focus. That is a good enough balance. But if somebody is too much tilted in the task focus, which is what usually happens in startups because they are based on tech, they are based on manufacturing, they are based on legal services or, or some of these very task focused jobs. If somebody is too tilted that way, they are not going to have the people skills or for example, the language skills. It's becoming more and more important to be proficient in, in Chinese in order to navigate, first of all, a new cultural environment, a kind of binary cultural environment, jumping back and forth between these two Chinese cultures, or, and this is one of the importance of people skills, if they don't have the necessary profile to find the people and build a great team to surround them and even out uh, the, uh, the weaknesses that any single individual manager inevitably has. So the second point that I want to leave with you 
is even let's say you start a tech company or start a law firm and the person in charge is quite imbalanced because let's say he or she is a, a, a perfectionist genius in a, in a field that requires uh, detail attention, it requires perfectionism, systematic and uh, risk controlling behavior, surround them with people who have the flexibility, who have the outgoingness, the agreeableness, who have the, uh, the people focused attention so that they can turn this expertise into the language of a quite complex cultural environment. And then finally, and I, I said, I, I did this in the reverse order because if you look at your team and if you look at your service, you have to ask yourself a, a, a very tough question actually is, does China need us? Um, I have been giving this advice for the last 15 years to European SMEs, but 15 years ago, it was a fairly subjective question. Do you think China needs your product or service? But time has changed. And actually, there is an additional element of risk here, because if China doesn't need your service or your product here, actually, probably you, you will even find it much harder to get a business license here. So now, when it comes to individual visas and when it comes to the business licenses of foreign-owned entities, China is fairly tough and they will welcome with open arms people and companies who have the expertise, the know-how that the country needs. But if you come with an industry that is polluting or is based on uh, poorly uh, paid labor or something that the Chinese government doesn't welcome, you are going to have a tough time even starting up your business here. So this is what I do most of the time. Um, my, uh, my work here has been quite interesting. I started off working with mostly Western, mostly European uh, entrepreneurs and managers trying to get around in China. I have been doing it in the form of speeches, conference moderation, assessments, advisory, workshops, training, and so on, uh, writing articles. I've also published a couple of books about these topics. But recently, something interesting happened is that I started doing it the other way around. So basically, uh, as Chinese companies go international, and as some of the locally started international enterprises grow, and their local workforce, Chinese people, first become managers, and then they grow to the level when they take on international responsibilities, then I started doing this whole intercultural leadership thing the other way around, and preparing Chinese managers to work mostly in Europe or um, in other places that we generally call the West. So if you have questions about this, I am. Um, uh, I hope that you, you took a snapshot of my contact slide. If you didn't, then I'm sure that we are, we are going to be able to share my contacts in some other way. And with this, I would like to open up to the question and answer session. And as I said, during the question and answer session, I would like to remove my slide so that the interaction uh, sounds or looks more personal. I hope that is fine. Thank you very much, Gabor, for, for this uh, amazing presentation. I think uh, most of the participants have uh, notions, if not a uh, deep knowledge about, about the Chinese market, but recapping and reviewing how things have changed and where uh, actually opportunities and, and, and challenges lay, it, it's quite important. Um, we have a received- A quick question. Yep. Uh, would it be okay with you if I paste my email address into the chat box? Please do. Thank you, because that would be a good way to share it without showing another slide. Thank you very much. So we have received a few questions. Uh, the first one is uh, from somebody that actually uh, was present in a presentation you, you made yesterday uh, at oh. the China Crossroads. And uh, he, he really liked it, apparently. And uh, he would like to know your opinion on the role of Chinese returnees, both born abroad and overseas students in management roles in EU companies. Okay, could you please repeat that? Yes, I'm going to rephrase it as it is. Um, how do you see the role of Chinese returnees, uh, both born abroad and overseas okay. students, in management roles in EU companies? 
Yes, yes. So um, Chinese retinees, there are, there are two kinds. It's important to point out. Um, one kind of person that we would call retinees is the kind of person who was born abroad and sometimes is a son or a daughter of a multi-generation uh, Chinese family. The other kind of retinee is who, who went somewhere abroad, spent five years, perhaps finished their studies there, um, had a couple of um, years of work experience there, and then brings back that experience to China. And they played an enormously important role going back to the beginning of the reform and opening, because at, in the 1980s, when my, uh, when my father was actually working in China, there were no local Chinese people with international experience. The, the country was even, you know, it was very difficult to travel from China, but even if you could, you wouldn't have had the money to do so. So um, uh, people who were born abroad um, in Chinese families, spoke the language and knew the culture, they played a pivotal role of the first businesses coming into China. So basically, if you were, let's say, an American or a Japanese business, and you wanted to open up in China, you wanted to snap up somebody and give them a big salary for coming back to China, which at that time was considered quite risky. You know, you have to remember that these families left uh, under, under quite uh, scary circumstances at the time. As China opened up more and more, then the so-called returnee population started going both ways. So I worked together with lots of Canadian Chinese, American Chinese, Chinese people born in Japan, Chinese people born in Australia. And as China became less and less risky to live here, uh, let's say uh, not just politically, but also because the, uh, the medical services became better and so on, more and more of these people just came back at the time when I came around 2000, because there were amazing opportunities here. And a lot of Chinese people could go abroad, but you need um, some time for the short-term returnees to mature, so to speak, because you have to spend five years abroad, you have to study there, you have to work there. And then around uh, 2000, early 10s, uh, so 2010, 11, 12, that's when these people started coming back to China. And the difference between the two kinds of returnees was that the second wave of returnees, short-term returnees, they brought a much more updated, up-to-date um, experience and knowledge about management methods and so on. Where they are now, uh, it's always pros and cons. Uh, that's how the world works. Um, the Chinese government attracts with very generous packages people who are in badly needed industries, um, anything to do with... Uh, artificial intelligence, quantum, a lot of tech, uh, big data, some pharmaceutical, some banking. But I would say 80% of them are a little bit disappointed because they don't get the huge salaries that they used to uh, anymore. And another one is that a lot of both state-owned and local Chinese companies that are private companies are actually more and more proud to work the Chinese way. And returnees may have a kind of reverse culture shock when they are returning to China. Because uh, whereas, let's say in 2012, somebody from the United States was hired by a private Chinese company to teach them how to work in the American way, the same returnee today would, let's say, join a, a Chinese tech company, and he would be very much expected to learn how to work the Chinese way. Thank you very much. It is indeed interesting to, to understand uh, this uh, uh, effect that was not there before. Um, we have another question from one of the previous speakers uh, in yesterday's session. Um, so we'd like to know uh, if there is any reason why China is uh, focusing so much in Hainan uh, and to convert this, this free trade zone in one of the biggest in the country. Well, for those of you who don't know what we are talking about, so Hainan is a tropical island at the south of China. The southernmost point of the country is in Hainan Island. And uh, it is, uh, we usually know it for two reasons. Uh, one of them is the Miss World Beauty Contest that was, that was there over 10 years ago. And the other one is this question that probably uh, the, ask, the, uh, the person with the question would like to know about 
new development zones, new developments that some people would say uh, can replace Hong Kong as an international commercial center. Now, what you will, what you have to know about Hainan is that apart from the beautiful beaches and um, the ethnic minority with, with really fascinating traditions, for the, for um, over 50 years now, you also had a lot of industry there. So a lot of chemical industry was in the island because water was widely accessible. Also, some of China's space program takes place in Hainan Island. So it's already um, a, a quite um, important economic hub. And China is trying to create a, a free trade and special economic zone there. And the, um, how do you say, the results are absolutely spectacular. So uh, Chinese people cannot travel for the moment, but they love shopping duty free. So it's, it's, it's really worth a trip to Hainan to feel like, you know, you made a trip to Seoul or to Tokyo where people usually did that duty free shopping beforehand. So there are, there, are certain, there are certain retail goods where uh, the, the traffic in Hainan is something like one third of, of, of the world's turnover right now. So for example, certain alcoholic drinks at the moment. I doubt that it would ever replace uh, Hong Kong uh, in economic terms, simply because the secret of Hong Kong is not its location or um, its duty-free shopping, but it's internationally compatible legal and financial system. And, and that's not something that the Chinese government plans to introduce in the island of Hainan. I, I hope I gave a good enough answer to this question, but if I didn't, you will let me know. No, indeed. And this is very important that you linked uh, with Hong Kong on this topic because our next speaker is going to talk about supply chain and also a little bit on the role of Hong Kong. Um, unfortunately, we are running out of time. Uh, there are a couple of questions in the chat function, Gabriel, if you don't mind uh, typing the answer afterwards uh, so everybody... Happy to could uh, could get their feedback. Uh, we will be very grateful. Thank you very much again for making yourself available today and for this insightful presentation. And now- Thank you very much for having me. I, I wish I could be there in person, but here we are. Thank you very much well, again. Well, for... we hope that next year we can send you an invitation to be in Brussels. So be it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Gabriel.